Greetings, APW family. This is the audio version of the March-April 2024 Postal Worker magazine and my column, which we'll start with. Greek philosopher once said, the only constant is change. Postal Management's network quotes modernization plan, mostly driven by changing communications and advancing technology, is underway. Members are legitimately concerned about its impact on jobs and service. You deserve honest and fact-based assessments and perspectives from your national union leaders. Whether positive or negative, operational changes are not new. For generations, much of the mail was manually sorted on trains. By the early 1970s, the railway mail service ended and distribution moved to fixed buildings. The advent of mechanization introduced the letter sorter machines, LSMs, where operators keyed one letter every second. Crews of 17 clerks replaced twice as many manual sorters. There were around 100,000 LSM clerks. LSMs were eventually replaced with barcode and optical character reader, OCR, machines. Today, two delivery barcode sorter, DBCS operators, can sort more mail in an hour than the entire LSM crew. In the 1990s, tens of thousands of clerks worked in over 50 remote encoding centers, RECs, typing in information when OCRs were unable to read the addresses. With advancing technologies, only one REC is now needed. Rapidly advancing technology has become part of our daily lives from computers, smartphones, and online shopping to emailing, texting, and electronic bill paying. Massive amounts of information and, and misinformation are just a click away. While we marvel at this technological revolution, we should recognize that it deeply affects the Postal Service and our jobs. The Internet has drastically reduced mail volume, especially first-class mail, historically the main driver of postal revenues. At its 2001 peak, first-class letter volume was 103 billion pieces. Last year, the USPS delivered 46 billion first-class letters. Even if we are successful in our ongoing efforts to restore overnight July 2012 service standards, letter volume will continue to decline hence the need for expanded postal services. Few letters now have stamps, negatively impacting retail services. In the last 20 years, the average daily delivery per address has dropped from six pieces to less than three, while e-commerce has caused a welcome increase in packages. The reality is that changes in the mail mix, from fewer letters in flats to more packages, result in changes to the workforce, machinery, transportation, and buildings. We cannot stop the march of changing technology. Those who claim otherwise are doing you a disservice. How to make technology work for workers, such as winning a shorter work week, is a long-run challenge. Management has the right to build new buildings and deploy new equipment, but they do not have the right to delay the mail. Management also has the right to move employees to where they need them but not in violation of our union contract. Through it all, we will keep our eyes on the prize, a vibrant public postal service for generations to come with good union jobs and job security. From the local level to national leadership, the APW will continue to unite with the people against any parts of modernization plans that degrade service. We will continue to enforce the contract when it comes to moving and accessing employees. We will stand firm in upcoming negotiations to protect our career job security protections, the no layoff clause, and the 50 mile limit on accessing. We will wage the vital fight for new and expanded postal services. We will continue to share updated information with the members. Postal workers have faced generations of changes in technology, methods of communications, and far too much mismanagement. But here we stand, united strong. Yes, the seas may be stormy. By linking arms with each other, building unity with labor and community allies, 
and forthrightly facing the winds of change, the sturdy ship APW, built over generations of struggle, will chart the path to safe harbor and a bright future for postal workers and the postal public. I believe our postal service is quickly changing into a failing business model, and our universal service obligation to America has been disappearing, and we have got to fight back. The Postmaster General has degraded our service standards, and he isn't stopping. His business plan is to destroy us, and he has lost the confidence of our customers, which has been affecting our mail volume and revenue. His plan drives us further away from meeting our service obligations. His network plan is not fixing service, nor is it fixing the work environment. The plan includes short staffing, accessing, losing workers through consolidations. The failure to monitor or train the terrible managers that we have contributes to the hostile work environment. It's so bad that the Postal Service can't retain new workers and has a very high turnover rate. Our customers trust us but overall rating, according to the Pew Charitable Trust, has dropped from over 90% to 77%. I would surmise that if a poll was done today, it would be under 50%. As we watch the PMG just bulldoze the Postal Service into a packaged trucking business, like the one that he owned as a USPS trucking contractor. He is destroying many prop services that America depends on and loves. Express Mail used to be the most affordable overnight service. The PMG's plan also limited the airmail service. And the latest report shows that USPS is paying out more refund guarantees than what it takes in for Express Mail. And that's even after his latest rate hike. The public depends on prompt service. There is a lot of people that still send birthday cards, holiday cards, letters to and from grandparents and children, postcards, care packages, and packages with items that they can't fit in their suitcase when they're on vacation. In some cases, it is even difficult to get passports due to the low staffing. The Postal Service used to process over 90% of passports in America, but not anymore. When there is no first class, there goes all the timely invitations for weddings, graduation parties, baby showers, special events, letters, home from college students, the care packages filled with love to support their work, letters and care packages from families that support the troops to keep their strength up, and the services that restaurants and businesses utilize through the Postal Service to grow their dreams of success. Let's not forget certified return receipt services that we use for legal protection in serving or notifying the courts, the Internal Revenue Service, and businesses in a timely manner local deliveries from pharmacies, hospital mail, veterans mail services, and important letters and deliveries that rural communities need. Shipments of live animals, bees, crickets, and fertilized eggs, live plants, food, dry ice, and water samples, medical tests and results, business mailers, nonprofit groups, mailing needs of their supporters, religious organizations, academia, and newspapers, and retail deliveries for those Americans who work from home selling goods online. They all need an affordable postal service. And just think about vote by mail and the political campaign mailing that could face even more delays with this plan, throwing our democracy to the wind. Everyone needs to step up and stop this plan because it does not deliver for America. 
and we've got to do something now before it's too late. As workers and community members, we want the Postal Service to provide mail services in a prompt, efficient, reliable, affordable manner that does not discriminate as to the service you will receive based on where you live. That language comes right out of the universal service obligation. Take action now. Write your letters to the Postal Board of Governors, to the Postal Regulatory Commission, the Office of Inspector General, your congressional representatives and state attorney generals, and get at least three other community members to write to. Track the delivery of the letters that you are sending to these offices, and you will be surprised at just how much the mail is getting delayed. So please save our mail service by using it now, sending those letters to the important people that have the ability and the authority to stop this plan that the Postmaster General has put together. Thank you. Energize, mobilize, organize is the theme of the American Postal Workers Union 27th Biannual Convention which is set for Monday, July the 15th through Thursday, July the 18th, 2024 at the Huntington Place Convention Center in Detroit, Michigan. The National Convention is the union's highest decision-making body and helps the union chart its course for the future. Approximately 2,000 APW delegates will debate and vote on resolutions that will be introduced on a wide variety of subjects. The resolutions give focus to the union's goals and help us better serve our members. National Convention credentials must be signed by the local president and one of the following. Secretary, Secretary Treasurer, or the Treasurer. Beginning April 1st, they will be able to log on to the members-only section of the APW website, and in just a few easy steps, they will be able to register their members for credentials. Upon presentation of proper credentials, alternate delegates may be seated in place of regular delegates who will be absent from that point on. June the 1st is the deadline for the submission of resolutions for publication in the convention book. Resolutions are accepted from local or state affiliates, local and state retiree chapters, or from members at large who are the only members permitted to submit resolutions under their own signatures. Resolutions adopted at division meetings, either during an off year or immediately prior to the National Convention, are also accepted. Resolutions from local or state affiliates and local and state retiree chapters must be submitted electronically through a special link on the union's website that will be accessible only to local state retiree chapter presidents and to local state retiree chapter secretaries, treasurers, and secretary treasurers. There will be a box to check, certifying that the submitter is the authorized officer, which will serve as an electronic signature. Members at large must sign and submit their resolutions directly to the National Secretary Treasurer prior to the June 1st deadline. Resolutions must be typed, double-spaced, and submitted individually, one per page. Resolutions not properly certified electronically or signed will be returned. Although the convention is months away, it is essential that local state organizations, members at large, and retirees make their arrangements as soon as possible. Everything you need to make your hotel and travel plans can be found at apw.r backslash convention. The APW negotiated a special room rate for this year's convention at various hotels in downtown Detroit. The rate for single W occupancy ranges between $198 a night plus tax to $281 a night plus tax, depending on the property. The cutoff date to make reservations under the group's block is Wednesday, June 19, 2024 at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Please make your room reservations directly with the hotel. Rooms and rates will be based on availability. You must use a credit card when booking online. You will receive a confirmation of your reservation via email. Be sure to mention that you're with the American Postal Workers Union in order to receive the negotiated rates. Additional details, including links to book directly with the hotels, 
will be available at apw.org backslash convention. For each room, a one-night stay deposit plus tax is requested with payment by credit card. Failure to notify the hotel a change in arrival date will result in cancellation of the reservation and the deposit will be forwarded. Kitty Corp, a professional child care company, will provide activities for delegates children ages 6 months to 12 years during the four days of activities on the convention floor from 9, to 5 p 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Reservations are necessary. Submit the forms that are available on the website by June the 17th. APW has made arrangements with Enterprise slash National for discounted car rental rates for convention delegates. Information regarding reservations can be found on the APW convention webpage. Several other important union events will take place in the days before and after the convention. Meetings for each of the divisions, clerk, maintenance, motor vehicle service, and support services are set for the weekend of July the 13th through the 14th, as is the APW Retirees Conference. The BFC Conference will be held prior to the convention on the afternoon of Thursday, July 11, 2024, from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Time. The APW Research and Education Department will conduct a series of pre convention workshops on Friday, July the 12th. The complete schedule of events can be viewed in the convention pages at APW.org. Energize, mobilize, organize. Energize, mobilize, organize. From the ceiling to the bottom of whatever, we're looking forward to this convention so that we can energize, mobilize, and organize. Thank you. Shining a Light on Safety for Workers Memorial Day, read by Charlie Cash, Director, Industrial Relations. It is the responsibility of management to provide safe working conditions in all present and future installations and to develop a safe working force. Do you happen to recognize that sentence? It is the first line of Section 1 of Article 14, Safety and Health. When I first started at the post office in the mid-1990s, safety was not the first thing on my mind when I went to work. In hindsight, it should have been something I took more seriously while I worked on the floor. Like hundreds of thousands of other postal employees in those 20 years, I too sustained a workplace injury. In fiscal year, FY 2023, 44,999 postal employees have sustained injuries. However, I must qualify that number. I believe that is significantly more than that. This does not account for the probable thousands of unreported workplace injuries. Also, in fiscal year 2023, 12 postal employees lost their lives due to workplace injuries slash accidents. The Postal Service consistently has some of the highest, if not the highest, number of injuries and deaths in civilian federal service. It is not an overstatement that the Postal Service is a dangerous place to work. Each postal worker, regardless of craft, work location, or duty, is entitled to a safe work environment. This includes freedom from hostile and harassing work environments, and management bears the responsibility to provide safe working environments. And each employee, union officer, or steward must hold management accountable when they fail to provide it. Each year, on April 28th, the labor movement celebrates Workers' Memorial Day. It is held on the date that the Occupational Safety and Health Act went into effect, April 28, 1973. This law and the formation of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, also known as OSHA, was a step towards safer workplaces and providing basic safety protections to workers. But the laws are nowhere near as strong as they need to be. As referenced by the AFL-CIO on their Workers' Memorial Day webpage, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, and the Mind Safety and Health Administration, MSHA, 
lack the resources they need to protect workers. Many employers and workers never see OSHA in their workplaces. Penalties are still too low to be a deterrent. Corporations exploit these weaknesses and create environments where workers are not adequately protected when they speak out against unsafe working conditions. Black, Latino, and immigrant workers are disproportionately killed on the job. Workers still cannot freely join a union without retaliation from their employees. Each year on Workers' Memorial Day, we, the workers of the world, attempt to shine a light on the more than 300 workers around the world killed every day on the job. Nearly 5,000 workers are killed on the job each year in the U.S., one of the safest countries to work in. We, as workers, demand better laws to protect ourselves, participate in vigils to remember those who have died, and lead job actions in support of safer workplaces. You deserve to come to work, put in a fair day's work for a fair day's pay, and come home to your families free of injury or occupational disease. Our contract demands safety. I am challenging all of you to demand safer workplaces, not only on April 28th, but every day. Use the processes that the APWU and the USPS have in place. Use your PS Form 1767 to put the Postal Service on notice of safety violations. Use the grievance process to enforce Article 14. Protect yourselves by being alert to workplace hazards. I want you to go home uninjured. You want to go home uninjured, and your loved ones feel the same. Solidarity. This is the Motor Vehicle Division's article for the March-April edition of the Postal Worker magazine. The future is here. Many postal workers and patrons in years gone by remember the quarter-ton Jeeps, the two-ton trucks, and the long light vehicles the LLV that outlived their life expectancy by over 20 years. Customers could tell when their mail was being delivered by the distinctive putt-putt sound made by these types of gas-powered engines, some with speeds that wouldn't allow for travel on freeways. For many years, skilled vehicle maintenance facility employees have diligently maintained the postal fleet. At times, the ingenuity of these employees was what kept the fleet going. Robbing Peter to pay Paul type of repair, taking parts off of one vehicle, or making parts in the shop just to ensure that there were enough vehicles to make the dispatch. As the nation grew, more addresses were created and mail volume increased. So did the need for postal vehicles. Many more trucks were leased, drive-out contracts that paid carriers to use their personal vehicles were used, but it still wasn't enough. This self-sufficient government agency still needed congressional assistance to meet the demands of the country. By this time, America had serious concerns about the environment, global warming, and saving the planet for future generations. For the USPS to secure federal funds for vehicle purchases, there had to be a commitment for eco-friendly energy-saving vehicles, next-generation delivery vehicles, and Ford e-transit. The Postal Service has an expectation to purchase at least 66,000 next-generation delivery vehicle in the battery electric variant. There are positives and negatives to having a fleet of electric vehicles. Each post office and VMF that will have an electric vehicle must also have a corresponding number of charging stations. The greater the number of battery electric vehicles, the greater the stress on the electrical grid. 
charging stations take up space and can also affect parking. There are fewer moving parts in a battery electric vehicle, which creates a reduction in maintenance required in these vehicles in comparison to a conventional gas powered vehicle. The postal service's mailbox to mailbox type of delivery won't fully utilize the vehicle's ability to put electricity back in the battery while braking. Next generation delivery vehicles emit no pollution and almost no noise. Recently, the USPS, along with White House officials, held an electric vehicle and charging infrastructure launch at the South Atlanta Sorting and Distribution Center to roll out the four e transit battery electric vehicle as part of the fleet. On January 9th, APW representatives Garrett Langley, Michael Miles, Albert Lewis, and William Drew participated in the first article testing for the Ford electric vehicle at the Michigan Proving Ground in Romeo, Michigan. The group evaluated the interior, exterior, and driving characteristics with safety and functionality in mind. The 4D Transit is a battery electric commercial off-the-shelf left-handed drive vehicle. The Postal Service has purchased approximately 9,500 of these four-size vans that have an eight-hour charge time with an approximately range of 200 miles and should primarily be used on park and loop routes where box-to-box -box delivery is a requirement. The Ford E-Transit is marketed as an eco-friendly alternative to gas engines with less maintenance costs. The APWU representatives noted several issues during the first article testing and notified the Bolster Service in writing of our findings. A few notable concerns include the larger center touch screen that could be a distraction, a sidestep that could become slippery in inclement weather and a bulkhead door latch that could be a pinch hazard. Stay tuned for more information on the Postal Service's response. The future is here. This is Legislative Director Judy Beard reading my article titled Federal Retirement Fairness Act reintroduced. Late last year, the Federal Retirement Fairness Act, or H.R. 5995, was reintroduced in the House of Representatives by Representative Derek Kilmere, Democrat, Washington, District 6, and Representative Don Bacon, Republican, Nebraska, District 2. This bipartisan bill would allow temporary postal and federal employees who are promoted to career positions the option of buying back the time that they had worked as a non-career employee to use toward their retirement. Temporary postal employees are non-career employees, such as PSEs, transitional employees, and casuals who are unable to make contributions to their retirement benefits until they become USPS career employees. Prior to 1989, postal workers were allowed to make retroactive catch-up contributions to their retirement benefits after they made career status. For all of that time, they worked as a temporary employee. Unfortunately, the authority to make Retroactive payments expired on January 1, 1989. Under the proposed buyback, eligible postal workers will be made will make a deposit equal to the amount that will have been contributed to their retirement benefits had they been career employees. The calculation is determined by the Office of Personnel Management (OPM) 
This legislation would help postal and federal employees better prepare for their retirement. It would affect more than 100,000 APWU members who were converted from temporary to career positions. As of February 1st, 2024, the Federal Retirement Fairness Act has 70 co-sponsors in the House of Representatives. I urge every member to call their representative and ask them to co-sponsor HR 5995. You can call the legislative hotline at 1-844-402-1001 to be connected at any time. Remember, an injury to one is an injury to all. We are much stronger together in solidarity. So please help your fellow union members in this collective fight for full on-time retirement benefits. Thank you. This is Dalio Freeman, National Human Relations Director, and I'll be reading In Unity, Civil Rights and the Labor Movement. Historically, the intertwining narratives of the Civil Rights Movement and the Labor Movement stand as powerful testaments to the resilience of the human spirit and the pursuit of equality. As Martin Luther King Jr. eloquently remarked, the labor movement was the principal force that transformed misery and despair into hope and progress. This article delves into the profound connection between these two movements, exploring the shared struggles, triumphs, and the enduring legacy they have left for generations to come. The mid 20th century marked a pivotal moment in American history when the echoes of the mid 20th century marked a pivotal moment in American history when the echoes of justice reverberated through the nation. The civil rights movement led by courageous individuals sought to dismantle the oppressive shackles of racial segregation and discrimination in the country. Simultaneously, the labor movement championed the rights of workers, demanding fair wages, reasonable working hours, and an end to exploitative labor practices. King's vision extended beyond racial equality to the economic plight. He also recognized the symbiotic relationship between civil rights and labor rights. In a speech delivered to the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organization, AFL-CIO, in 1961, he declared, the duality of interests of labor and Negroes makes any crisis which lacerates you a crisis from which we bleed. The civil rights movement drew strength from the labor movement and vice versa. Both movements found inspiration in the shared pursuit of justice, equality, and the unassailable belief that every individual deserved dignity and respect. Martin Luther King Jr.'s words resonate as a timeless anthem, inspiring those engaged in the struggle for justice. If you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, that crawl, but whatever you do, you keep, you have to keep moving forward. The synergy between these movements reached in crescendo in 1963 when King delivered his iconic I Have a Dream speech during the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. King declared, painting a vivid picture of a future where justice and fairness prevail in every aspect of society. The struggles faced by African Americans and all laborers intersected on numerous fronts. Discrimination in the workplace, wage disparities, and the denial of fundamental rights were challenges that both movements confronted head on. King recognized the potency of unity, stating, our needs are identical with labor's needs. 
decent wages, fair working conditions, livable housing, old age security, and health and welfare measures, conditions in which families can grow, have education for their children, and respect in the community. The legacy of the civil rights and labor movements endure, casting a long shadow on the path toward progress. The legislative victories, such as the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Fair Labor Standards Act, stand as monuments to the hard-fought battles waged by these movements. Yet, the journey is far from over. In conclusion, the harmonious convergence of the civil rights and labor movement serves as a beacon of hope and inspiration for generations to come. As we reflect on the indomitable spirit of Martin Luther King Jr. and the countless individuals who stood shoulder to shoulder in pursuit of more just society, let us draw strength from their legacy. In the words of King, the time is always right to do what is right. The tapestry that wove included threads of courage, perseverance, and justice. Fight for the common good continues to shape our collective journey toward a more equitable and inclusive future.